possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello and welcome to the RTE GA podcast. I'm Mikey Stafford. Uh, we have plenty of football, plenty of hurling to talk about this week, so we're dividing and conquering. We're going to have a two-part podcast. Later on today, we will have Jackie Tyrrell joining us to look ahead to the Clare versus Limerick in the Munster quarterfinal slash Allianz Hurling League final, and also to Dublin versus Leash in the Leinster Hurling Championship. But right now, I would like to say I'm delighted to have Debbie Dolan. Uh, Rory O'Neill and John Fogarty of the Irish Examiner with us to look ahead to the football for the weekend. How are we doing, lads? Good, Mikey. Very good. Good stuff. Glad to hear it. Um, I suppose we have to start at the beginning. In the beginning, at the moment of everything is COVID. That's where everything begins and ends. And it's been, it's been a hectic couple of days. I think myself and John, I was texting John last night, see if he'd have an hour spare to come on a podcast because it's been relentless this week from a news point of view, John. And, uh, the latest news is that Waterford have handed Antrim a forfeit uh, this weekend. They're not going to fulfil their fixture for a variety of reasons, all COVID related. But um, the one that stood out to me and the one that we're, we're actually trying to get a bit more information on as we record is a couple of employers saying that their staff would have to uh, undertake 14 days quarantine if they travel to Belfast or the Ballymena, which isn't one I've heard before. But... Basically, here Waterford, there they've no, they're, there's no jeopardy, so it's an easy game to say. Look, we won't play it; it's not worth the risk. So you can have the points, and we'll leave it at that. Yeah, that that's it in a nutshell, Mikey. I I'm exactly like yourself. I'm at a loss to understand the employer's reason. I don't know where this is coming from at all. Um, the island of Ireland is treated as the same. Um, in regards to these issues, there is no quarantine necessary or isolation. So. If that's a reason, I think it's just flounders, really. You know, it's just, it's not it's not good enough. At the same time, I appreciate the concerns that players would have about travelling that long together. Um, you know, we see we see so many situations. We see Kerry, the, the Kerry's COVID convoy driving up to Inneskeen last week just to make sure that they're doing, you know, just to make sure that their players are casual contacts to each other and this is the this is what it boils down to keeping a casual contact as long as possible DJ Carey said it there the other week we're doing everything to ensure our players are not close contacts but clearly the Offaly Hurlers now have a problem as well don't they? The Offaly Hurlers Russ Common Footballers and Russ Common Footballers some of them are being considered close contacts so that's an interesting one when you know the definition outdoors anyway is casual so just how long how much have they been together inside is the is what we 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 hopefully will ascertain because a lot of other counties will want to know or learn the lessons from this but uh, going back to Waterford um my understanding of this there had been reservations about this for weeks so um there was a precedent set with Ross Common uh, not Ross Common, apologies, Longford. Uh, um, and Leeds from, in a sense, although the, the more time goes on, Rory, uh, the, the more appreciation I have for, for what Roy McMenamin did in bringing a, a group down. Yeah. I never believed there was going to be 18 players. Like, we all know that you can make changes up until the, to, to what, 40 minutes an hour before the game. So if, I, when 18 names were released out there, you know, yeah. it was about, whoa, I, I fully believe that they were going to have a, a good contingent coming down and fair play to them. I, 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 the height and they, I, I, and they, they came away with, like, they only got bet by two points, I think. Exactly, the they, exactly, they did. And, you know, I, not, not that, that there was any gamesmanship or Ricey was trying to pull people, uh, wall over people's <laughs> eyes, but um, Fermanagh had something to fight for there. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, um, they're either going to have to reach an Ulster final next year or um, earn promotion from Division 3 to avoid um, uh, the, the, the B Championship, the Tal Team Cup. So that's interesting in that regard. But yeah, the Waterford issue had been known for weeks, had been known for weeks, Mikey, um, uh, but there is probably a precedent set this week where what uh, Longford have done in annulling or giving a walk over to Cork. I'm sure Cork are a little bit happy anyway because they were they would have had a hotel bill in Johnstown House this week and uh, now that's not, uh, that's not, that doesn't have to be paid for now. Yeah, Desi, does this does this in any way call into question the kind of the legitimacy of or, or like the, the the status of the Allianz League? And would there be a case made where the GA, given the narrow window, uh, everything we now know in hindsight, but would there have been a case to say, look, lads, 
the league. Maybe we'll finish it next year. Maybe we'll just have to null and void the 2020 league. Let's focus on the championship because these two rounds of matches could lead to so many kind of such a build up of problems that it could impact on the championship, couldn't it? It could, but I suppose what you're seeing is the difference between Division 1 and 2 and Division 3 and 4. I, so some teams in Division 3 and 4 are happy enough to concede them and with, without, too much, without too much fight, which is disappointing. Like, Park Davis is effectively saying that you just don't see the value in it. I'm probably minding his players as well, I would say. Um, you would imagine the preparation of playing Cork would be a help going into a championship, but I suppose some players are just feeling and it's just interesting I, on, on the point last week John I think Roscommon went up in two buses and, and that that kind of implicated some of the players and you referenced the Kerry footballers going up in individual cars and and the other side of it as well if you look at Roscommon they have a they have a, poly, a player on the panel of last week in the 24 man squad who was tested positive so on the bus then you have half the panel or half the squad of players that are impacted as close contacts now. And it's interesting, you mentioned about you know, making sure that they're all casual contacts and the Kerry footballers, and it's coming back to probably haunt us common. But at the same time, they're in Division 2. They're chasing promotion. What are they doing? They're saying, at all costs, we're going to play the game this weekend. And it is interesting to see because the only thing, I think it's an outrageous score difference could catch them out. But they know off the field, but in a reasonably decent performance, there's still a possibility to lose that. They will get promoted. But it just comes down to team management and stuff like that. Uh, I was in Armagh myself last week doing covering the game for RT. I came back to work all week. I hope I'm okay on that front. But the, the thing, the reality is, the reality is now you have Division Three and Four, and like let's be fair, it's a different league. It's a different standard. It's a different place that players are in in terms of Division One and Two, and it has been for quite a while. Except right now, teams are just looking at the league and going, it's just not worth playing. Mm. Rory, um, this is kind of a, a selfish one from, from my point of view because of how we calculate the, the league tables on our website is that you actually yeah, have just to... Look, I'm just a, looking a, at them there. A, match, a team has to win a match for them to get two points. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's calculated that way. We don't manually put in the numbers. So as it stands, like Leitrim lost their match of the weekend nil-nil to nil-nil, like, which, makes, which makes no sense. And it, we literally can't do anything about our tables. We, so our tables are wrong. Sorry, everybody in the IT website. Our tables are wrong because we had to award down a one-point win. And we had to, you know, you see what I mean? And we'll have to give Antrim a one-point win this weekend for our tables to actually work. So that's my selfish point of view. But from the other point of view for teams, like we've seemed to now have ascertained, John, that Wicklow, Wexford, and uh, Antrim, if they finish on the same points, will be a mini league to, taking into account their results. But Rory, is that the best way to do it? When you look at soccer, um, Wexford Utes got penalized. Sorry, Wexford FC got penalized last week for an ineligible player. They lost all their matches three nil, except one of the matches they'd actually lost four nil. So that result stayed the same. But the the uh, the result brought in is three nil. Should the GA look at because this could happen again next summer or next spring? Should the GA look at bringing in some, like, a team should be punished. Like, you shouldn't just lose the points. Your, your points difference should probably well, be well, impacted. Yeah, yeah. No, John might correct me if I'm wrong here. They will be fined, John, won't they? Uh, if it's COVID-related, that it remains to be seen. But I, I think there will be, oh, I do think... Or narrowly, yeah, yeah, no, it might, yeah, exactly, you're yeah, spot yeah, on. There, be, there yeah. might be a dispensation put in place if, because if it's COVID-related. But mm. ordinarily, if you get, can see the walkover, I just know this from a club game. If, yes. we can see the if we can see the club match, there's a fine from the Dublin County Board, and it's significant. So if you're doing that at national level, the fine will also be significant, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at a time when county boards are really... And like, that goes back to the point that John makes. I know like, he's absolutely spot on in that Cork, the Cork County Board would be delighted that they don't have to bring 50 people up to Longford. But I can tell you this much, the, the, the players and the management are really pissed off about it because they have two weeks from... Saturday to the Kerry match, the chances of them being able to arrange a challenge match now between here and then are, are very, very low. Um, so they were actually looking to, you know, blood some players, give, you know, stretch out the panel as much as they can. They've, they're developing a very young team. And the, the, to them, this was a good opportunity to kind of road test maybe a championship team away from the bright lights before going in and maybe ambushing Kerry. So I think the players and management are a bit annoyed, but the county board, I'd say, are probably happy enough. Um, I think the biggest problem for Division 4 is it's kind of heading into a very sort of a... 
Well, the integrity of it is now very much in question. But, like, is it really that important? Then again, I suppose the same thing. Like, you've already got London who are eliminated <laughs> from the competition because of, obviously, the logistics involved. Will they even be allowed to compete next year? That's another question. Um, like, you have, like, obviously at the top end then, it has the, the walkover given by Watford is going to have a significant impact on the likes of Wicklow, Wexford and Limerick or and Antrim who are all chasing promotion. So I don't know. I think the long story short on the leagues was I think the intentions when this was plan was originally devised way back in the day was good in that it gave teams a couple of games before going into a knockout championship match. I suppose in hindsight that's brilliant. That was a great idea. No, maybe not such a good idea. But I suppose that, like there's no there's no right or wrong answer with any of this. You know, like it's very very tough. On I would have a huge amount of sympathy for administrators and trying to manage this because I'd say you know it's fireman Sam time like they're every every time they, every time every time they look around there's a new fire that they have to put out somewhere yeah. else and it, it's tough going like you know yeah. it is like the, the hypothetical situation here is that the, as Rory says there the, the GA brought in the league or they wanted to finish it obviously for the sake of 2021 but they wanted yeah. to give a running start to teams Waterford won't have a running start now because they, they don't have any games going into their monster quarter final but in hypothetically speaking, if the two games, the guarantee of two games were in the championship, do you think Watford would pull out of a game of a qualifier against Antrim? You know, that's the, it's another question to think about, you know. But, uh, and I think as well, John, I think as well, going back to Mike Quirk's point, I mean, look, to be fair, like, like the, the, the most logical thing to do in the situation would be for Watford and Antrim to play in Parnell Park, which is, which is an hour and a half mm -hmm. up the road for both teams, like, you know. I think that sort of stuff maybe needed to be looked at. Now Dublin might turn around and say we don't want chief, we don't want any yeah. COVID coming in here, like so. Mm. You know, so the, the, the other interesting thing here is the clearly the GPA's recommendation from the NEC last week wasn't picked up at all by the CCCC because there was no neutral venues. We we got on, on Monday before the announcement was made regarding level five, we got the fixture lists for the week, and uh, they were all the original fixtures or in the original counties anyway. So. Um, certainly what the GPA proposed was not heeded in that regard. Yeah. Um, so look, the, the games have been going ahead, so and they will be going ahead this weekend by hooker, yeah. by crook, it would seem, apart from Division 4. Um, so Desi, you, were, you, you, you drew the long straw last weekend, you were at Roscommon Armagh, which was, a, which was a clinker of a game. It, was, um, it went this way and that. I had Armagh versus Wicklow playing in the All-Ireland final at halftime, but uh, Roscommon, in fairness to them, came back, scored three goals, and now our COVID allowing in the box seat to, to qualify from Division 2 and I think they were probably the one team we said at the start of the year were likely, you know, they were your sure bet or at least your, your shortest odds to get out of Division 2 but yeah. it's very interesting to see who will go up with them you would have to say. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, I suppose just in, with Roscommon, there's a lot of positivity. A lot of players maybe for one reason or another had, hadn't turned up last year and I think uh, Sean Malouli is one player that is into the side this year is doing a massive job the Mertes weren't around at start of the season. They're, they've hung on and they're staying in. Um, and this, I think the, the reason why Roscommon are kind of very optimistic is that they're going maybe possibly going up to Division 1 with a strong enough squad. I think this, the strength of squads now is something that's vital and it will be vital going forward because you see the players are picking up in, injuries, hamstring, muscular injuries because the intensity has gone up a level from your typical club match. So now what you're seeing is players going off injured. Um, I do, I, to be honest, I think Armagh will go down. I thought Armagh were very good uh, in terms of their forward play, their ability to kick scores. They just seem to run out, of, uh, they run out of energy. They need to sort out defensively, they need to sort out what they have because if they can fix the <laughs> defensive side of their game, they definitely have the firepower up front, but they're giving away soft goals. Like, and the runners coming from everywhere were scamming trying to get these goals, and they worked. But for Kieran McGinney, it must be very frustrating to sit in the bench and watch them time and time again to get themselves into great positions, do so much work, and then give away silly goals. Because I've seen them against Westmead, and this was way back in March, and it was exactly the same. Armagh looked a way better team, and then they came out of the game with a draw. The last day, from large parts of that match, you would say Armagh were the better team, and then come the last 10 or 15 minutes, seemed to lose their way. But I do expect them to have enough to go down. Um, like Westmead are in the hunt, but that's the, you're looking on a lot of results to happen for that. Um, but then I suppose it's all as well, like, like, like Division 1, 2 and 3, it's all about what happens at the end of the table or the bottom of the table because a lot of these tables are extremely bunched. And that's the one part of the league that people do enjoy in the fact that a lot of the teams are extremely even. So therefore, all of the games generally have something to play for. But I can't really blame the, small, the, 
the, the counties, I said smaller counties, but I can't really blame the counties in three and four. Like, would you blame them for not turning up in situations like this? I, and I personally, I don't. Yeah, um, it, it must it must kill Kieran McGinney to be the manager of what you could describe as a, a Spursy football team, but uh, they are very enjoyable to watch. John, one thing that had been said, it was kind of noticed, as, and Desi mentioned it there regarding fitness. Jack O'Connor made the point after his own team's, uh, after Kildare's match last weekend, that he said they, he just felt their legs went at 60 minutes because that's what they'd all been used to playing club for the last few months and uh, I saw some reports at Leash against Westmead as well kind of there they just kind of they lost their way in the last few minutes just fitness is this a concern for managers or is this exactly what the league's going to do it's going to put those 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 minutes into the legs and everything should be fine for a week or two's time it's interesting Mikey I, th- I think um, a lot of the developing counties are suffering the most um, those whose county championships went on longer obviously we know Kildare had what a three four week lockdown during the when they should have been playing games so that is caught up, up on, on them indeed I remember um, driving to Inneskeen or driving back from Inneskeen on Saturday and listening to on RT to some of the reports and the players were f- you know, in the lower leagues anyway, we're falling like flies, certainly on listening to the radio on, on Sunday as well. Uh, we're, we're falling out like flies, whereas it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue in, in Division 1. And obviously, you know, the, they have more capabilities, they have more resources. Um, Kerry mentioned it's it's well known at this stage. Uh, we're all, every player was given a, a spinning bike during the lockdown to ensure that they would keep up their, not just their, not their fitness, their conditioning, because that's been a huge thing for them this year to put on that little bit of bulk and that little bit of, um, you know, just conditioning really. And it's, you know, the likes of Dublin and whatnot, they don't seem to be suffering from it, whereas those lower counties absolutely um, do. Mayo, obviously, because they have, what, five games in five weeks, if they want to reach a Connacht final, um, they're going to use, they've been putting out in challenge games, they've been playing an A and a B, and a B team. They're going to have to use a hell of a lot of players over the next while. So as much as we haven't seen the likes of Higgins and Boyle, who's made an amazing recovery from that cruciate uh, difficulty earlier in the year. Uh, I, I imagine we will see them at some stage or another because they're going to be needed. But they, again, they have the resources, Mikey. The, the, the likes of Kildare are in a, in a difficult situation because of what happened during the summer. Yeah. And as well, and as, as, can I just say as well, and that is, like, if you think of Connor Daly picking up a hamstring injury the last day, like, there's a good chance his season could be over. Like, if you're talking mm-hmm. a bad tear of a hamstring, Damien Comer. <laughs> Like when you seen Damien Comer, like I think there was a realization when you, the camera went to him and in in he's sitting in the dugout with the ice pack on, and like he's after tearing his hamstring. Now there's different grades of tears of hamstring, obviously, but like if it's a, any sort of reasonable tear, it's six weeks at a minimum. Yeah. And and effectively, you're talking that the season could be over. So it's a big risk at this stage as well. And and like teams are suffering. You, there's no point saying they're not. Like it's very rarely when we're watching games you see so many lads pulling up, pulling their hamstrings and things like that. Whereas, as we said, inter-county football, the intensity levels is a total little level. And the reality is, teams losing players, like Damien Comer for Galway, changes yeah. for me, the pers- changes the possibility of Galway contending for the All-Ireland. Yeah, those two, those two injuries, that, they were an exception this weekend. And, you know, we all have to remember, I think we, we got the lesson this weekend and over the last while that we're back to five subs. Um, would six subs, although it, 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 six subs absolutely is in favour of the, the stronger counties, but would six subs, we're going to see more injuries over the next while, especially with the intensity of the schedule. Um, yeah. It really is going to be a difficulty for some of the Division 2 and Division 3 teams three teams who have aspirations are going to provincial finals you know would six subs have allowed that little bit of leeway um, maybe I don't know but it, 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 it's something to consider because we are we are going to see season en- season ending injuries over the next while as much as this is a season in a in a very blitz format yeah best, it's, the best medical team could win the All-Ireland this year well, so I, was just going, I was just thinking that like your, your medical team your doctor your physio and your COVID officer are probably going to become <laughs> A, a sort of a, 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 very, key, a very key <laughs> yeah, a new hey. category there John <laughs> some of them could be playing if they're not careful <laughs> but look at it so look at it this weekend and I suppose Kerry didn't seem to have uh, Desi Kerry didn't have any issues at the weekend they, they played lovely stuff they yeah at, at arm's length and now you know they guess they they win on Saturday for some strange reason they're playing twenty four hours before the rest of them um so they can actually yes. wrap the league up against um 
I'm drawing a blank. Donegal, of course, yeah. which is a tough, tough yeah. game. But they can, they can wrap the league up probably. They'll probably play a relatively strong team because I imagine they want to win the league. But you look at ah. Mayo, John just mentioned how many matches they have. Mayo have to beat Monaghan. Or sorry, they have to, um, they have to beat yeah. Rhone because Monaghan, you would imagine, are going to beat Meade. So if, if Mayo want to stay in Division 1, which they obviously do, they're there longest, I think, aren't they? They're going to have to yeah. put out a strong team. And this, again, you're getting into weighing up the importance of the league, the need to get minutes into legs versus avoiding a Damien Comer. Yeah, absolutely. And in fairness to Peter Keane, he's a type of manager that you just don't know what he's thinking anytime. And by, by that virtue, the players don't know what he's thinking. So like when you get your jersey, when you're on the panel, you've got to perform because he's that... He asked Curry footballers down there, well, what's the story? How's the team going? Like, he's brought it to a new level of secrecy in terms of, what the, in terms of the way he prepares his teams. Like, he's a very cagey character and he's not particularly fooling anyone. He's not particularly fooling anyone, but it certainly goes about his business if he is. Anyway, once he's happy doing that. But the other side of it, Mayo, I was really impressed. I have to say, it was a very enjoyable match to watch Mayo. I, going into the weekend, I was like, ah, oh, there's a team now that are on the way out. They'll probably struggle. A few of the lads are getting old. But at the same time, the performance against a couple of new players, they seem to have gears. When they're in bother in the league, it, they've been in the league, I think, Division 1, 20 years, I'd say, at this stage. Uh, they haven't fallen out in a long time. But the one thing about them is when they seem to be in bother coming towards the end of it, they always find a couple of gears to stay safe. So I would imagine, on the other side of that, Tyrone, look, Nicky Hart's there so long. Personally, I'd like to see a change in that, freshen it up and see what Tyrone can do because I just think it's gone very mm. stale there. It's 12 years since he won his loss at Ireland and I just think it needs something in Tyrone right now. Um, but the prize is important. Like Banty with Monaghan, he's a proud man. man. He won't to be going down division two like so it'll be very interesting that division one how it plays out yeah it will a quick word on the bottom of division two rory it's looking for man yeah. post obviously and then it's between uh leash and claire so leash have to travel to fermanagh what kind of team fermanagh put out or what kind of mood they're in is kind of a hard one to guess and claire are hosting our math so if uh claire claire need a win uh sorry well a point actually will do claire given the points difference and um so it does look like Leash are in a bit of bother there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, it, it's yeah, it, it, it's a, it, it'd be a hard one to call. It just depends on how much focus from Mana put into it. And Arma, as we have seen, can blow hot and cold. I saw Arma earlier on the season. I went down there. I was down there for the Leash game, um, where they played Leash under lights just before COVID. It was a Saturday night, wintry enough night now, and the weather conditions were poor. But Leash absolutely wiped the floor with them right, and yeah. they stank the place out of it. So Armagh can blow hot and cold. Long old journey down to Ennis. You know, let's see what they're made. That it'd be a good test for them because I think I think Clare will make the provincial final. I think it'll be Clare versus Kerry in Munster. <laughs> and I get a sense that they they'll put a big push on for this, you know. So he's got Podge, he's got Gary Brennan, he's got Jamie Malone, he's you know, his He's a, he's a deeper panel now than what he would have had much earlier in the season. There's always a good spirit about them. Claire, no, Claire, Claire will give Armada a fill of it, and I'd expect them to be safe, yeah. Okay. And then, John, as a man, man with the Irish Examiner, you've got, you're keeping an eye on Division 3. Obviously, Corker are home and hosed. Um, even before the weekend's play, they'll, they'll garner full points. Um, who do you see going up with them? It's... It's all a bit yeah. of a mess, really, isn't it? Like the whole point, to, like it, it's just, it's taken a bit of the, not that there's ever that much luster on Division 3, except obviously yeah. the uh, Chelton Cup this yeah. year, obviously is a factor, but it has kind of made spoiled the last weekend of it, hasn't it? It has a little bit, Mikey, but Down can make things very simple for us. They're playing a loud team who they own yeah. to last year because Loud, um, it was the result against Loud that basically denied Down promotion to Division 2, so... The, that derby um, gives them a real opportunity. They'll be well motivated for that. And the fact that Loud probably, uh, well, if Longford, as Park Davis said to me earlier in the week, already have eyes on Loud. Loud will have eyes on Longford. And I don't expect Loud will be putting up too much of a fight in that game as much as they, they, they'll be happy for the run out. Uh, things are a lot more interesting at the bottom of the, of the, the group, especially this Limerick Tipperary game, um, mm. especially, especially after what Leitrim did last week. And, um, you know, we have to take them at the word. Um, at the same time, they knew that 
um, they could forfeit that down game and it wouldn't impact, certainly not greatly impact their uh, aspirations of staying up in Division 3. So that, that game is uh, is a serious one against Tipperary. You saw what David Power said at the weekend. Yeah. They're, they're, he's coming up with the Galtie, the boys from the Galtie Mountains. Uh, he's coming up with the guns to lead from in Carrick yeah. at the weekend because they're, they're fuming. Um, they, they really are um, peeved with that. Um, Terry Highland obviously outlined some of the situations there. You still would have felt that Leitrim should have put up a team of some sort to go to this game, but um, it's uh, all roads lead in this because, as, as far as I can see, it, Mikey Down will, will beat loud and take everything out of uh, the equation at the top of the table. But uh, Limerick and Tipperary, um, you Leitrim and Tipperary. The lead from in Tipperary, so apologies. Offaly obviously have to beat um, Derry to ensure they, they stay up. Um, Derry's um, motivation, have I would imagine, has gone a little bit now that they know that, uh, that their hopes of, of promotion are, are, are not looking good at this stage, especially if it goes to head to head, because I think they, they don't beat them earlier on in the year. Yeah. So the Tipperary lead from game is, is the big one. Okay. One point, Mikey, though, just, for, just before we, I know you might be wrapping up the football fairly soon there, just one point worth making. This whole Talchin Cup. I think people should forget about that. Um, not <laughs> indefinitely. Not indefinitely. I think the Talchin Cup might happen at some point, but I don't see it happening in 2021. Like this isn't like the situation we're in currently isn't a binary situation. It isn't going to be the case that we wake up on February the 22nd and someone will click their fingers and everything is just going to go back to normal and to the way it was. It, this is be a long, slow, drawn out coming out of this whole thing because it'll take time. If, if, if the fairy godmother that is the vaccine ever does arrive, that'll be slow in rolling itself out. So like the Talchin Cup, if it happens at all, I don't see it happening without any fear of favour in 2021. So people can kind of chill out a small bit on that. I do find that there's some people obsessed about it. I see, oh, we won't get out of this and we'll be in that competition and blah, blah, blah. Like to my mind, what the intercounty season will probably represent in 2021 won't be too dissimilar to what we're about to witness over the next eight weeks. I think people just need a bogeyman, don't they? They they just need to add a bit of spice to the to the league as well, as we're seeing there's problems with it. I think it just adds that little bit of uh, yeah. Yeah, but the, the the only thing about it, is I, 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 I absolutely take your point, Roy. I think we're going to revert next year. I think the, the days of the Super 8 are gone, obviously. The, the oh, next, yeah. year's, uh, next year is supposed to be the, the, the final year of it, but what we're probably going to get next year is um, uh, we'll be going back to the qualifier system. So w- whether it's a qualifier system... You get two bites. W- like. w- yeah, without the B Championship, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, they cut down to two rounds. It's going to be yeah. along those lines. We're getting dangerously close to talking about championship structures here, so we're going to call it a day on the yeah. football front. <laughs> yeah. Desi, thanks very much for joining us. For the, uh, enjoy the matches of the weekend. Cheers, oh, Des. Thank you, Desi. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses. Uh, welcome back. We've been joined by Jackie Tyrrell from his car on the side of a road somewhere. He wouldn't put on a tie for us, but we're very glad he's here. How are you, Jackie? Looking dapper I'm as good. always. I'm good. How are you, gents? Good, 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 Jackie. Very well, Jackie. Um, so, the championship starts this weekend, which is which is a, a lovely thing to say that perhaps we didn't expect we were going to say, Jackie. And uh, it starts starts in our own province, you know, proper order. Um, so we have a, a, a grudge match, a revenge match. Your former teammate Eddie Brennan going up to Croke Park to face Dublin, who will definitely, definitely have an axe to grind with Leash. You'd have to say, wouldn't you? Yeah, look, Dublin Leash, uh, it's great to, to get the ball rolling in Leinster this year and obviously revenge is, is, is top of the agenda probably from, from a Dublin point of view but Matty Kenny will be trying to, you know, dilute that down in a small bit and not get too caught up because, you know, I've played in games where you're trying to go out and revenge and you get caught up in all, all that. There's a game to be played, it, it's, 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 it's Leash, it's in Crow Park which will probably suit both teams um, and, I, and I do think Eddie would probably wouldn't have wanted this disrupt, disruptive season. He would wanted to continue to build on the momentum and flow that they had last year and roll into this year and keep that going. Um, but, you know, Dublin, it, it's very hard to, to really analyse any team with no form. You're looking at club form. I suppose the only thing from a Dublin point of view is it looks like Chris Crummy is going to be pushed back up to the forwards again. He will add physicality. He will add a bit of penetration up there. But that would always raise alarm bells in my mind when you have to go push a back up into the forwards. What's that saying to your forwards? Uh, look, is, is, the, is the unit not good enough? Have we not enough physicality up there? Um, so I wouldn't be a bit concerned from a Dublin point of view to hear that. You know, Conal Keeney is obviously, I think, still knocking around. 
But you know, he's as old he's as old as me, so you can't really rely on him to offer that physicality and ball winning ability up in the forwards. And that would have always been the question of this Dublin team. When the when the push came to shove, have they the guys in the forwards that can put their hand up and get a score uh, when they need it? Um, I wanted to ask you, Jackie, as Eddie, of course, you know him very well, played with him for many years. What do you make of his comments? He's been quite outspoken. Like, you know, you wouldn't say calling for the GA Championship to, to be postponed or called off, but asking a lot of questions. And I just, I do have a wonder about what impact that might have on his players, if any. Because, like, he's a very, like, he's kind of a thoughtful fella. He's not, he's not saying, as we said last week, he's not saying this for headlines. He's a Garda. He's, he's well-informed. But I just wonder if you're preparing for a match and your manager is in the media kind of wondering whether the match should be played at all, whether that could have any impact on the players. Yeah, it's a fair point, Mike. It's, it's a question well worth asking. And look, we won't really know the impact of that until probably half seven Saturday evening. I suppose if I'm a player and my manager is, is in the media and asking those questions, I suppose I probably would look at going, you know, what's going on? Where's our focus? Uh, maybe we should be keeping our head down and, 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 and not, you know, being as vocal about it. Look, at it, 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 that's what Eddie's done. In fairness, Eddie would always have called out things if he felt something wasn't right. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't be shy about saying it and, and he would have been like that in the dressing room as well. Um, I'm not surprised that, that that's his way, but you know, maybe from a managerial point of view, um, you, you might maybe hold back a small bit and wait, wait, wait maybe and, and articulate those thoughts maybe after the game um, because it was so close to it. But I suppose in the last week, number of days, there's been so many commentary and that it probably got swallowed up in that. So, uh, I don't know how much the leashed actual players will put weight on it, but looking in from the outside, it probably probably was a bit maybe um, a bit too much uh, narrative and spoken airtime given to him from Eddie's point of view. Mm. What do you make of that, John? I think Eddie has had a lot of, in terms of preparations, uh, there's a lot of hurdles being put in front of him, Mikey, over the last while. Obviously, the, the championship uh, structure leashed going into lockdown, just like Jack O'Connor had with Kildare. A lot of, uh, I don't think, you know, it was said many years ago when Nicky Brennan was uh, the president that when people were giving out about the league, he always felt that people were getting their excuses in early. And I, I take what Jackie is saying. It would seem that way a little bit from, from Eddie's point of view, but I think he's trying to um, deflect things away from the players a little bit. I think it's, you know, he's... He's put it up to Dublin a little bit as well. You know, he wants to see, you know, let, let, let's see if you have the stones here to, to, to actually exact revenge on us. Like they played earlier on in the in, in, the, in the year in the league and it was a win for Dublin, but it wasn't that, that convincing a win. So, I, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Clare and Limerick shortly. Clare, the suggestions that David Fitzgerald, uh, another defender slash midfielder, might be moving up to the forward line against Limerick on Sunday. And I, I, I absolutely take Jackie's point that is there enough ball winners in this Dublin full forward line? Um, I imagine that, you know, Matty Kenny, Greg Kennedy are going to put it up to the boys at the weekend and said, right, boys, you know, these hurt you. They, you know, it's, it's felt in Crow Park as well that there wouldn't be six teams in the Leinster Championship next year if, if it weren't for Dublin beating, uh, if Dublin hadn't lost to Leash last year. So um, there's a lot riding on this in many ways. Uh, I've, I expect a Dublin victory, but um, especially with some of the players that Leash are missing um, and a lot of them who have opted out at the start of the season. Yeah. Rory, what to make of it? Uh, considering the success Dublin have had, now I know it wasn't today, I say you are going back to the days of Anthony Daly, but Leinster champions league champions. I've seen it written a few places in the last few days that teams don't fear Dublin in any way, shape or form the way they might fear Kilkenny or even Wexford in Leinster that, you know, despite the successes they've had, despite the playing pool they have to call on, despite the pedigree of their manager who was so well thought of coming from Kula, that there, there's, no, there's no element of, oh shit, it's Dublin. Yeah, I suppose there's an idea. They wouldn't... They're, Nobody would ever have a fear factor going in playing them. We'll say certainly amongst the traditional counties, anyway, for whatever that means. Like I think the biggest issue that Dublin have probably faced, really, I suppose, over the last ten years, is some of the best underage players that they've produced have they've lost them, and uh, to 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 obviously Gaelic football. And I like I think you would be looking at a much much different Dublin, you know, if they had access. Even if they just had access to Con O'Callaghan, I think the difference that he would make on his own, if you were able to position him at 14 and maybe then you, you know, are 11 and then you have Keeney maybe coming out, you know, and just have to have that ball winning 
predator inside in the square who's just a supreme athlete, I think that would make a huge difference because like, he is an absolutely top class hurler. There's no question. And I think if you go back, there's there's other players like a Kieran Kilkenny. I don't know what his hurling abilities would be like now, but when I saw what I saw of him as underage, I think that's that's been an Achilles heel for them. Like, and that'll probably always be the way. They'll always be the secondary team in in Dublin as a result. Now, having said that, they I do have Kilkenny a fairly footballers. They do have, but they do have a like. They, they, I sometimes hear <laughs> Dalo kind of bemoan the fact that they have a very small pick. Well, they'll have a bigger pick than a lot of counties. I mean, some of the clubs they're drawn from. If you look at all the clubs across the south side, in particular, Coola, Ballyboden, Kilmacud, Ballantyre, they're massive clubs, like absolutely huge clubs with huge playing numbers, both hurling and football. So, you know, I suppose like the big thing for them is like going back to what Jackie says, they just don't have that ball winning ability in the forwards. And it is definitely a little worrying if you see somebody with the sort of uh, presence of Chris Crummy, I presume, I think he's, is he not the captain? Is he the captain of the team as well? As the as captain, as, yeah. yeah. So if you see someone like him being sacrificed to be pushed up into the forwards to give them that bit more of a presence, plus what it leaves them. I mean, are they that wealthy in terms of wing back centre back options that they can afford to move them up there as well is another question yeah. I'd ask because like, to my mind, he's one of the best hurlers in Ireland and you do have to be careful when you kind of get betwixt and between in a positional sense and you're trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. Sometimes you can try and be too clever with these things. Now, mm. from Maddie Kenny's point of view, like he's got an incredible track record with Kula. Uh, he was definitely one of the most sought-after managers in the country. He was definitely in the mix for the Galway job. Certainly, I think, when Michal Dunne, who was going for it, maybe next time around as well when Shane O'Neill ended up getting it. Um there's no doubt in my mind that the defeat to Leash was definitely going to be a black mark on his copybook. And if there's anything about Dublin at all, they should come out on Sunday to win this game, given what happened last year below in Ormore Park. How, how do you see it going, Jackie? Because you know, I just think about, like, you know, if you're talking about physicality, if, you know, if, if Leash bring out, like, if, you know, Chad Wire and Willie Dunphy into the middle of the field, it could be a very uncomfortable evening for Dublin. Who, it has to be said, do, the hurlers do seem to prefer to play in Parnell Park than Crow Park as well. So there's something of a venue factor there as well, I would think. Yeah, I, I would agree with that also. My, look, I, I, would, I would be anxious to see, will Dublin play Mark Schumte? Is this guy going to feature? Um, I've marked him a few times. This guy could be the ball winner. You could position him at 14, drift him out to half forward. Um, he, he's very athletic, very pacey, a good finisher. Um, if he's back in among the fold and playing well and returning to his form of kind of 14, 15, 16, he can be a handful. Mm. Um, the Chris Crummy thing, I, I have alluded to that, but until this Dublin team make a statement win, there's always going to be this tag of, you know, have they the stones for that, that John has, has alluded to. Because they came down to the Kenny last year who were obliterated with injuries. All the narrative was it's now or never for Dublin. A great start. Uh, Five up at half time. Strong, strong position at half time. And they fell apart in the second half, Mikey. They fell mm. completely apart. They can put Porrick Welch in at centre-back and it transformed the game. He caught a ball and they got a goal off it. And Dublin, they didn't come back with Anton from it. And then they, they got turned over by Leash. So until they make a signature win, and a signature win could be an emphatic win over Leash the weekend, uh, or maybe beat McKenney in a Leinster. Until they do that, that tag is going to remain with them. Uh, there are serious question marks out. And particularly in their forward line. If their backs, I do believe if Chris Crummy's in their backs, couple that with Sean Moran, couple that with Owen O'Donnell, who's probably one of the best defenders in the game. Keno yeah. Callan is as good as a car, sticky man, Martin cornerback. Paddy Smith isn't too simple either. Throw Shane Barrett into the mix. There's a good set of six backs there. It's the questions remaining in the forwards. And for those, for that reason, I know that revenge is probably top of the menu for Dublin, but I'm going to give a, a tip of my hat to my old colleague, Eddie Brennan. I believe that they could co probably come with something probably uh, that Dublin aren't ready for in Crow Park. And I do believe the pace of Paddy Purcell and these guys at Crow Park will suit them. And I, for, for the record, I also actually have a, a sneaking feeling for Leash on this one. John, how do you see it going? I completely disagree with the Perry. I do think... <laughs> that's <laughs> no, what we want. No, we want. no like, Jackie makes a, a very... Like, Dublin actually, one to seven, if you include Crummy, have yep. probably one of the strongest defences in the country. And, mm -hmm. and Paddy Smith was very close in All-Star nomination last year as well. Uh, Owen O'Donnell, the spine of it. Rush, obviously, is at the age now where they're trying to get as much out of him as possible. Obviously, 
injuries have affected him so much and you, you know if 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 they were so loaded with boys in attack would would Conor Keeney still be around would even Liam be still around um but you know Liam is a force of nature when he's fully fit and uh he's been you know pillar to post we've seen him as centre back we've seen him midfield everywhere and full for nearly across the the whole spine of the team. No, I I I do fancy Dublin to win this, and I would suggest if it was a Parnell Park, I think it would have suited Leash more. I think the the fitness factor of Dublin, they've had more time coming into this to get themselves right fitness wise. They've had more time together, um, as opposed to Leash. You no, know, I fancy Dublin to win and to win with a little bit to spare. And then so Rory. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I go along with John. I think, like, I just, and just to go back to the whole revenge thing, like, I know that you know, <coughs> if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you think back, like, I mean, the week before Leash had beaten Carlo in the Joe McDonough, and we saw the Buff Egans and all that kind of crack going on on the Sunday and the Monday and the Tuesday, and they were parading the cup. And no one gave them a prayer going in against Dublin because they were having to turn around the game within seven yeah. days. And I think yeah. for them for them to go in there a week later and beat Dublin, ad- admittedly, you know, and albeit below in Omar Park where Leash at home advantage. To my mind, if I was a Dublin player, I'd be spitting, spitting fury over it. Like, you know, like I I think they have nobody to blame but themselves for losing that match. They just lacked stomach. And it, you could sense it from the very first time the ball was thrown in. And if there's anything about them, I think it has to come out on Saturday and they'd expect them to win comfortably. Okay. We shall wait and see who has bragging rights here, even. Um, so moving on to matters in Temple Stadium on Sunday. Uh, John, you're covering the game for the examiner, I believe. Um, you, Claire, it's a, it's a litany of losses, really, isn't it? Uh, Brian Lund's having a first year to you know, forget Podge Collins, Colin Galvin, Ian Galvin, Niall DC. They're bringing in young lads which have impressed in the Clare Hurling Championship, and the Clare Hurling Championship is one of those ones where you just like it's a hot bed. Mm. It's like so many, so many competitive teams, so many close matches. So you are going to find players. You might find them in the Clare Club Championship, but coming up against the arguably the best team in Ireland over the last three years, you could say on average, um, it's going to be a tough ask, isn't it? It is, Mikey, and if you believe the challenge circuit, it's going to be even more difficult for Clare because they've last, lost the last couple where Limerick have be, been winning all around them. Again, um, there are concerns. There's four All-Stars out of the equation now. You know, Podge has obviously gone to the footballer, so we don't know the whole situation there, but Conlon is a, is a, we talk about ball winning forwards. Ew. What a colossus, a, a huge loss, especially against a, a, a team the size of this Limerick group, uh, especially that Limerick half back line, which obviously will probably be changed a little bit now that, you know, Dan Marcy will probably go back for Mike Casey at full back. And that is, and that is the, the question that Limerick have to ask. There are going to be issues for their, um, for their full back line, but Aaron Costello might come in there for Richie English as much as Richie English is on the way to recovery now as well. Um, they've been going well. You know, everyone's been going well in training. That's the beauty of it. Like, but the, the great enigma at the moment is this Clare group. Um, next to Brian Cody, Brian Lohan has been the quietest manager around. Obviously, Tony Kelly did a bit of media this week. John Kiley did a bit last week. Um, Keen Lynch did as well. But we haven't heard much from Lohan. At the same time, the Clare team. Uh, it was leaked earlier this year, uh, this week, I should say, if it is anything to go by. And we're going to look at, they're clearly looking uh, at Shanahar at full forward, maybe Cunningham and Shane O'Donnell uh, playing off him. Shanahar would ask huge questions of any full back, but especially somebody, even Dan Marcy, going back in there as a makeshift one. So there, there's going to be huge, uh, huge questions there to, for Limerick to answer, you would imagine. At the same time, you lose so many guys like that. You you lose Galvin, who's a lovely hurler. Tony Kelly obviously was playing the hurling of his life again, looking like he was in his hurler of the year career prior to the lockdown. And that lockdown, you know, it came at a, a difficult time for a lot of teams. So I imagine more so Lohan because they were doing very well. They were into a semi-final of a league. Now they're into a final, a de facto final. Or it's not de facto, it is a final now. There's going to be silverware. Imagine how empty that's going to be lifting a, a cup now at the weekend with Tipperary waiting in the wings. But, um, they, they won't do a leash on it anyway. <laughs> no, I don't think they <laughs> uh, Certainly, no. I think they, 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 they'll, they'll be delousing themselves afterwards to make sure that they're right, whoever wins it for, for Tipperary the following weekend, whether it be in Limerick or Cork. But um, there's, there's, there's just too many questions over this Clare team for me at the moment going into this game. Um, Jackie, your, your 
I know you've, you've been you've been transformed into a, a ball winning full forward yourself, but let's be honest, your area of expertise is the full back line. You take those two boys out of the Limerick full back line, like it's is it a big ask to, to, to replace two thirds of your full back line for a championship match, or do you think the strength and depth is there for Limerick? Oh, there's no doubt about it. It's it's a huge hole in, in, in any team, let alone this Limerick team. Richie English is a a really, really top class cornerback. He's an all star, uh, very, very underrated. Um, and speaking underrated, Mike, Mike Casey, this guy, you know, he just he just does the simple things so well. When people talk about fullbacks, you no one ever says anything about Mikey Casey. You think of the job he did on Jonathan Glynn, who was causing a wreck in the All Ireland semi final. He just did the simple things so well. His positional sense, instead of going up to catch the big ball and burst out, he just flicks it down and he's over. He's so physically strong. So, you take a, a full back is an expert is a, a, an expertise that you know not too many people have. Dan Morrissey will go back there, a really good defender, but it's completely different playing wing back to playing full back. Your positional sense, when to go, when not to go, uh, going on your instinct, and then you're probably a, 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 maybe a rookie cornerback, maybe in, in Aaron Costa or maybe a Tom Condon. So it does. It just causes unsettlement into a team that was very settled. The only thing for it is that Limerick have an, a, a brilliant half back line who will drop deep, who will protect, who Keane Lynch will drop in and, and protect in front of him. So they do have those shields in front of it. But let, there'll be no doubt about it. You know, Brian Lone will be saying to maybe an Aaron Shanner who is very good in the air. Lads, let's pump ball in. Let's let's ask the questions early. Let's get ball into him and Shane O'Donnell. Let's see how good is this Limerick defence without these two guys. So it does. It asks, it asks big questions. On the other side of it, when you think of Clare's probably foremost key players in David McInerney, Colin Galvin, Tony Kelly and John Collin, two of them are gone. That's a, that's, that's a big loss in, in, in a time when uncertainty is at its highest as regards coming into games. There's no league form. And as regards... We say the challenge circuit that John has alluded to. That's the greatest shadow boxing I ever heard in, in all my life. Any time I play the challenge match with me, the Kilkenny with the club, and you sit back and the most common narrative is everyone played well. Why did everyone play well? Because they, everyone was just a yard off their man. You get one ball, I get two balls. You get two points, I clear three balls. Forget about all that stuff. And of course, that's the only thing that we can go on is what we hear from, from, from challenge matches. So it, it's very hard to analyse from that point of view. Of course, you'd have to give the nod to Limerick based on previous history, based on the injury crisis that isn't clear at the minute. But Brian Lone is a, is a resolute guy. He's resilient. He's a determined bio. And he will have these lads fired up. This is a local rival. So I expect, it, it, although the, 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 the balance is tipping towards Limerick and they're probably more, they're more physical team, Claire will have a real sense of a, of a go and a go at that Limerick full back line. I have to ask you, Jack, I have to go back on that challenge match thing because that's, that's very interesting bit of insight, which coming from anybody I would find interesting, but coming from you, having watched how you played hurling for Kilkenny and never watched a challenge match, admittedly, you don't strike me as the kind of man who would ever allow a forward to have anything. I would, <laughs> like, I, I'm not blowing smoke up your arse here. I just, I mean, you actually seemed a bit of a homicidal maniac on hurling pitch. So I, I, this idea that you would go out in a challenge match and actually just kind of let somebody have it, I, 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 I'm not buying it. No, I, I suppose it's the whole... You have to have your down time too, though, Jackie, don't you? <laughs> ah, you do, Rory, but like, there's a few times, and, and look, lucky enough with Kenny, we would have invited to open up pitches and things like that, and we went down to, to Limerick, uh, God, I think it was 2014, 15, when we opened up JP's uh, club down there, and it was a great... Great, it's a great occasion. We all got fitted out in suits. They brought down the Kilkenny 1972 team as well. They honoured them down there. But there was just a whole carnival atmosphere. And before you know it, you go out and your, your man has the first two balls over the bar and you're kind of looking going, where's my suit now? And, and you're looking to line. And you know, so it's, it's just the whole mentality about it, Mikey, that you're going to a game, it's only a challenge match. And with all the best will in the world, and even the most mentally and the most focused lads, there's a lax atmosphere about it at all. Um, so, you know, that's, that's pretty, probably where my comments are coming from. Mm. It's, uh, it's interesting, though, Rory, isn't it? Because we, we said on the Hurling Preview show last week that we're operating in a complete information vacuum here. And this is yeah. a bunch of very, very ill-informed opinions, you know, and predictions. And, like, Jackie's just kind of poo-pooing the one source of information we have at the moment. It really is... We can go on who players have lost, who Claire have lost, we could say they're fierce losses. We don't know a whole lot about what, who they brought in. We could say Limerick were the form team in the country, or, or they, actually these two were two of the form teams in the country, but that was seven months ago. So mm. it's going to be fascinating. The first 10 minutes, we might have our minds blown in both these games. And the, the other thing as well, like 
we saw it last week in football, for instance, where Mayo, you know, took Galway to the cleaners. And to my mind, that was kind of a freakish result. I don't know how much of an impact that'll have when the two teams meet come championship. I would argue probably maybe very little. I think it'll put very, the significance could be quite small. I think you are going to get freak results. I mean, like, okay, there is a backdoor element, but by and large, look, if <clears throat> you kind of really need to hit the ground running, and if you don't, you could find yourself dumped out fairly quickly. So there is going to be a kind of a sense that we're heading back to championship kind of 95, 96 times where a team could go on a small bit of a spurt or of a run, win three or four games, all of a sudden find yourself All-Ireland champions. And that, those a, a freak result is absolutely possible in hurling. Are we going to get one this Sunday? I don't think so. Um, I'd say, I just think there's probably that little bit too much inexperience in the Clare team given what they've lost. Having said that, the one thing I would give them a small bit of confidence on, a little bit of hope, is they definitely will be able to get at that Limerick full back line. But to get at the Limerick full back line, I think, will require them to score at least three goals, I would say. They'll need at least, certainly two goals, and maybe even three. They're not going to score, um, they're, not going to, they're not going to do a Galway or a Patrick Horgan or a Cork and score 30 points. That's not clear, really. And especially given the hiding they took last year in the round robin stages below in the Gaelic grounds. So I think they are going to need to score goals. Now, they should be able to get opportunities because I think the Limerick full back line is unsettled. It's just whether or not they can get the ball in over that half back line. Because as Jackie said, he's spot on. I'd say what you probably will see is that Limerick half back line will probably sit that little bit deeper now, just to kind of, certainly in the early 20, 25 minutes, just to give that full back line that little bit of extra protection. Yeah. Uh, John, how do you see it going? Yeah, Mikey, uh, just take it up Rory's point. If they do sit back, um, someone's going to have to tag Tony Kelly. Like, I think yeah. what's been. You know, what's the rule of thumb for any team facing Clare over the last few years, especially during the times of Jim Connor and Don Maloney, is if you if you take if you negate Tony Kelly, you have the job done, or at least half of it done. Um, you imagine, you know, Will O'Donoghue was probably too big a guy to take him on, you know, because in the eyes of the referee, uh, it might he might look a bit too awkward in taking him on. Lynch would seem to be that type of a man who would do that. Um, but if you give that space to Kelly out there, you know, the, the further away, the other rule of thumb is the further away Tony Kelly plays from from the the, the, the opposing posts, the better chance you have yeah. against Clare as well. Mm. But it, it's interesting that Lohan might be looking towards something more direct. If Shanahar, obviously, uh, there's Colin Gilfoyle there who might come off a bench as well. So that'll be interesting. Aaron Cunningham back for the first time in three years is a huge asset too. But th this Limerick team know more about themselves. Kylie knows more about this team than Lohan knows about Clare. Derby's aside, and there's no team that fears Limerick. Um, more so than uh, that, that sh I should say they, they, Clare don't fear Limerick All in fear. the tightest ever and it's just like Limerick don't fear Tip whenever they play them but at the same time I think Limerick know more about themselves and they've had a good preparation from what I'm hearing irrespective of the challenge circuit that Jackie has just put uh, Limerick to win not by a hell of a lot but Limerick to win So Jackie this is interesting that, that Brian Lowe and the uh, famed fullback is maybe looking at the route one approach. Do you think it can work? Granted that we've just seen from Colin Fenley in a few Kilkenny Championship matches in the last few months, some of the greatest route one hurling successes in recent memory. So it could be fresh in the mind for Lowen, but do you give Claire any chance? Of course you would, Mikey. Yeah. And look, route one will always bear success in hurling because it's the most direct route when you have a ball winner inside. Whether it's Colin Fenley, TJ from a Kilkenny point of view or a Seamus Canlon, um, you know, and it'll raise his head every so often when we do go short and through the lines and that's lovely the ball to the square it does cause havoc and particularly when you have guys that aren't used to playing in, in, in positions that they're used to of course you, you give Clare a chance on, on, on the merit of they have Tony Kelly who's probably one of the best forwards in the game they were in really good form uh, early on in the year and Brian Lone was starting to bed down a, a, a team he's had injuries so but this, this Clare team is a very talented Clare team a lot of the guys still there that have won in All Ireland are still there. Shane O'Donnell on his day could beat you on your own. There's a lot of optimism there within the Clare thing. 
But to go back to John's point, who are the, who's the most questions about? It will be about Clare. This Limerick team are tried and tested. They've won all Ireland. They have a really strong panel. Yes, they have injuries, but they've guys to come in uh, and factor their teams in. And if they're, they're, they're half back, they most definitely will sit in front of them. So on, on that basis, you would you would say that the, there's more questions about this Clare team because of the unfamiliarity and the probably lack of cohesion and, and a year to really to really have a look at the panel and what, what styles of play to play. And look, John Conlon, what a, what a loss. Yeah. And speaking of questions there, who takes their freeze? Is it Tony Kelly now is on the freeze for, yeah, for Clare? Is it Jay? Yeah. No, he's well. not. He wouldn't be, like, he's an excellent free taker, but he's not Peter Duggan. For excellent. No. Do you know, he, he can miss the odd one or two, like. Mm. Yeah, I imagine it will be Tony Kelly, but again, they are an enigma. Clare are just an enigma, and that will worry Limerick. <clears throat> it will indeed. There's there's a lot of unknowns there. But geez, lads, after this conversation, I have to say I'm very much looking forward to this. Week. I can't wait. I actually, I, I, I have to say it. I just, that, I think it's an important point as well to make, given all the doom and gloom. I am buzzing, absolutely buzzing for Sunday, for Saturday and Sunday. I can't wait. And I know it's going to be odd, bizarre. Uh, strange, no crowds arriving to Tireless. Normally, seeing the, the the packed atmosphere around the square and the buses coming in, and like, look, I'm going to Tireless since I was eight, nine years old. Like, I mean, it's such a sort of a sort of a, a special place for lo- all hurling people. It's going to be very, very different this time round, but I think it's going to be different, brilliant as well. And I think people just need to kind of embrace the spirit of it. And I think it's. Like, like, look, the reality for us is, and I know it's great from John and myself and everybody, we all work in the, in the industry and we're all delighted that it's happening. But it's still going to be, and I know people are kind of poo-pooing the fact that, oh, it might not necessarily give people the lift that everybody seems to be in make out. And maybe it won't. And that's absolutely fine. I accept all of that. But I think for us to be kind of actually talking about action, talking about matches, talking about the best players in the country, talking about the games themselves. Like you're going to have Thursday and Friday, like we are today, previewing the matches. You're going to have the games taking place over Saturday and Sunday. You'll have the fallout on the Monday or the Tuesday. To me, what a tonic over the next six to eight weeks as this whole journey now takes off. And I absolutely can't wait for it now on Sunday. Jeez, I, I, grow, I grew two inches there now with, yeah. with that. Uh, we, we, we will acknowledge that there are there are obviously more important things in the world than the hurling championship or the football. There league, is the football not, championship. not that so many more important time, things. They, they, they can they get they, they mightn't be the opiate of all the people, but I think they're the opiate of the four people on this podcast, yeah. and so many of you listening. So let's hope the six week lockdown works, and let's hope at the end of it, uh, Wexford doing an All Ireland hurling final, and then Listen, everything will be fine. Dark horse, dark horse. <laughs> Um, yeah, do listen in to Saturday and Sunday Sport this weekend obviously we've got uh, on the television you've got Claire and Limerick on Sunday on RTE2 and there will be a Sunday game slash league Sunday on Sunday night Rory is it? Well it's the Sunday game it's the first Sunday game because we're dealing with championship but there will be obviously cover, uh, extensive coverage of all of the leagues um, Tomas O'Shea Wheelow on football on hurling I think it's Brendan and possibly Michal Donoghue and we're obviously on then on Sunday for the live uh, at three o'clock. And we've got Dalo and Don Log um, in the studios uh, with Joanne presenting. So, look, again, as I said, just to reiterate, can't wait. You got the weekend <laughs> off, Jackie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, off this weekend now. I might, might go and watch a few challenges. <laughs> <laughs> see, who's, see where the farm book lies, Jackie, yeah. is it? <laughs> Very good. Um, obviously, the RT News, uh, the RT News app, and the RT Sports website for all the reports and those challenge matches. Uh, that, no, for all the reports and reaction from the league and all the competitive matches, all the good stuff. Um, thank you to John. Thank you to Jackie and to Rory and to Desi, who's probably back at work now. And uh, see you all next week. This, how much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses! <laughs>